I love that point that he made about imagination and that we can do a lot of things in our imagination, but where our imagination stops, uh, God-sized dreams begin. But I believe imagination is okay. I believe God can use our imaginations. When we dream, we're using our imagination. And healthy dreaming is a good thing. And you probably are wondering what the subject of the message is this morning, but it's dreaming. It's the third core value that we uh, have adopted here, and that is dream big, then dream bigger. Amen. Expecting God's goals to be accomplished through us. A lot of times people are called dreamers and it's a very uh, derogatory sense. Oh, you're just a dreamer. Oh, you're dreaming now. And, and sometimes the dreams can be with an improper result. And there are times that there's some correction that needs to happen. If all of our dreaming is about us, that's not the kind of dreaming that I'm talking about. However, Big dreams that depend upon God involve us. I like what he said that people are scared that God's going to call them to do something more than what they're ready for. And he's absolutely right. Absolutely he is. But we're talking about God here. We're talking about the one who never fails. Huh? We're talking about the one whose unconditional love loves everybody the same. Every single person in this room Every single person watching, whether you have decided to follow Jesus or not, God loves you with an everlasting love. Thank you, Lord. He extends this toward us. Yes. He's not in love with our life choices. It doesn't mean that he's in love with our lifestyle or all of those kind of things. That, that comes into obedience. But his heart of love is not waiting until you do something he likes. Mm -hmm. Like it's not conditional. So, when we look at this dreaming big and dreaming bigger, it didn't dawn on me until this week. When we, when we set out these uh, core values, they weren't really in any order. And I believe last week I might have even said that. But they kind of are in order. It really struck me this week. Because when we started off talking about passionate, being passionate, we said that it's more than, it's not the, the horse, it's not the cart pulling the horse. The passion is not just something we do on the outside. We don't act passionate so that somehow inside will be changed. It starts here, right? It starts with an understanding of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and what he has freed us from and what he's freed us to do. And that makes us passionate. And we can be passionate about all kinds of things. And sometimes when you get into the building with pews and a steeple, we all act like we have to, we can't be passionate. And then as you, as you let that genuine passion grow in you, you find out that you're more willing to be the one. And last week we talked about being the one, not so much as in sign on the dotted line to volunteer, but in being the one, understanding our, uh, our, our, our uh, having a stuttering moment. Uh, our, our authority in Christ. Be the one. Be the one that God has made you to be. Be the one that God has recreated you to be. So when we have that passion for Jesus and then we realize what he's made us to be, we can with authority say, I will be the one that God's calling me to be. And when we do that, it unleashes the dreams that we have for his honor and for his glory. Dreams to reach people who are hopeless. Dreams to reach people that are trapped in bondage. Dreams to reach people that maybe, maybe they've had church hurt. Dreams to reach people that maybe their own dreams have been squashed down. And then next week as we close the series, we're going to find out that it all culminates in extravagant generosity and that's not just money folks although that's part of it matter of fact next week 
<laughs> you're going to be surprised at one of the points that I'm going to preach on. You wouldn't think it would come up in a message, but it will. Um, <laughs> extravagant generosity, spirit-led stewards of God's gifts to do His work. See, when we are properly impassioned, and when we come to understand who God has made us to be, and when we allow ourselves to dream God-sized dreams, we can't be anything but extravagant in our generosity. Amen. You know what? Whatever God has gifted you with, you, if you don't give it away, it's not helping anybody, yes, including you, including you. Well, most people don't wake up dreaming big dreams. Uh, dreamers who are permitted to dream when they're young generally mature and the subject of their dreams becomes beyond themselves. But a lot of people aren't permitted to dream dreams when they're young. And I'm going to give you a couple biblical examples today. The first one may be obvious to a lot of you from Genesis 37, Joseph. Joseph was called the dreamer. And when he was a very young man, he let it be known some of the dreams that he was having. And I'd like to read this passage of Scripture this morning. I encourage you to follow in your Bibles. Genesis 37, pretty easy to find. First book right in, 37th chapter. And uh, we learn about Jacob and his family, uh, his boys that would eventually, the, uh, the, the tribes of Israel would be named after. And we have Joseph who was very much beloved by Jacob. And also kind of maybe spoke when he should have just thought about it. <laughs> you know, sometimes when God gives you revelation or God leads you in some area, there are times to just internalize that before you share it. Because maybe there's a better way to share it. So I'm going to read here uh, today, uh, start at verse 2 in 37, and uh, we'll go on till verse 11. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, good old Pennsylvania Dutch names. Yeah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night Joseph had a dream and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream and again he told his brothers about it. Listen. I've had another dream, he said, the sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers, but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Boy, when you raise your kids, they're going to say some things. And the way we respond to what they say can make a world of difference as to what they will grow up and who they will grow up to be. I thought it's interesting here that his brothers dismissed them and were jealous. And his father, while he corrected Joseph, he also thought, hmm, what does this mean? I believe that Jacob saw something in Joseph. 
And while Joseph may have been the kind of teenager that, quite honestly, you didn't want to be around, uh, a little arrogant, perhaps. I think his brothers more than one time just kind of wanted to slap him. I know you've never met any young person like that. <laughs> the fact is, is that Joseph had some growing up to do, but he still had a call upon his life. Don't we all have some growing up to do? If, if you get to the point where you think you've grown all that you're going to grow in your walk with the Lord, there's a problem. We humble ourselves and we say, Lord, take this flesh and just, I, I lay it before you. Well, the rest of the story of Joseph is a rather interesting story. If you spend any time in church or went to Sunday school or maybe saw the, the play or the movie, you found out that there was a series of events in Joseph's life that landed him in a place where he found himself in prison for a decade or two. Uh, God used Joseph, and God got Joseph over his narcissism, but it took a little while. Let me ask you a question. And I think you can speak from experience. Would you rather humble yourself before God or have him humble you in public? <laughs> you know, God had to humble Joseph. But even while he was in prison for those 10 plus years, he did what was right. He had learned some lessons. What got him thrown into prison, he did what was right. He fled from a woman that wanted to get her mitts on him because he knew it was wrong. But still, it took some time before Joseph emerged and eventually became second in command in all of Egypt, and right in a just perfect timing, because he had another dream. And in this case, he said there's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of lack. And Pharaoh set him up to do the accounting and take care of things. And Egypt became the only world superpower that we're aware of that had food when nobody else did. And of course, he not only served Egypt, he served his family. Because he was able to restore relationship with his father and with his brothers. He was able to provide for them and also eventually bring them into the land of Goshen where they were uh, permitted to farm the land. It was one more step that God had in this, this burgeoning uh, nation that was still growing, had not yet been established. But one more step in God's promise to Abraham when he said, I will make you many nations and all nations of the world will be blessed for you, through you. And it took a dreamer. It took a dreamer with a little bit of an attitude problem. <laughs> it, took, it took a dreamer that maybe started off the wrong way. God was able to humble him and mold him and keep that dream alive. And look what he accomplished. I think the other one that pops most to our mind is the boy David, the boy who would become king. David goes down in history as the, the finest king that Israel ever had. David made some mistakes, but even his mistakes, he was known as the man after God's own heart because he owned up to his mistakes. The uh, story of David when he was a, a young boy, teenager, don't know how old, but pretty young. He had already been anointed by Samuel that someday he was going to be the king. And this fellow Goliath, who was the champion of the Philistines, came out and taunted Israel. This guy was nine feet tall. He was huge. Everybody was afraid of him. He taunted Israel for 40 days. And David had the task of bringing food to the troops, mainly his family, on the front lines of the war. And for 40 days, they stood across from each other, and Goliath said, I dare you to put out a man to challenge me. And one day when David was down there bringing food to the rest of his family, he said, uh, 
a few things. And here's what we find in 1 Samuel 17, uh, 26 to 28. David had asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? There was already a promise given that whoever could take this giant down would get a huge reward. And uh, uh, the king said he was going to give that man one of his daughters and the man's entire family wouldn't have to pay taxes. Can we say hello there? <laughs> so they repeated this to David. And uh, verse 27 says, And these men gave David the same reply. They said, Yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway? He demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. I love this translation, New Living. Verse 29, David says, what have I done now? I love it. David replied, I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Continuing in verse 32, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul, I'll go fight him. David was a dreamer. David had people around him that were saying, shh, just be quiet. You're just a kid. Just be quiet. <laughs> I had a memory come surface to my mind. It's amazing what we remember from our childhood. <laughs> I had a memory. I was, I was a teenager, uh, but a young teenager. The church where I grew up, they had an administrative board. Here we call it the executive board. And there was a lot of people, good-sized church, a lot of people on this board. And they decided they wanted to add a teen or a youth representation to the board. And they asked me. So I said, okay. So I go in, sit in this room. And they were not like our board meetings. They were, they were kind of depressing almost. At least I thought so. So one time, <laughs> they were having a discussion that the choir needed to pick a different room to rehearse in Sunday morning before service because the room that they had been using was needed for a class that had grown too big. And there was a piano in that room. And they said, well, we're going to have to find a room with a piano. And they spent 10 minutes talking about this. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm just a kid. I must be missing something. <laughs> so I said, well, what are you going to do with the piano that's already there? <laughs> and I never forget the one guy looked at me and says, I don't know, Tim. Maybe we'll throw it out the window. <laughs> And I sat there about five more minutes. Someone said, why don't we just move this piano? <laughs> just shut up. We have to have you on this board. Just be quiet. And that began my experience with church boards. And that was 45 years ago. You know... We, we, we can get so against dreamers. Like, that's just pie in the sky. God intends for us to dream big dreams for the glory of God. Amen. If your dream isn't bigger than you, it's not big enough. That's true. That's yeah. right. Yeah, if we're dreaming dreams for the glory of God, why do we stop when we come to the end of what we think we can do? It's a lack of belief. It's unbelief to walk in those kind of dreams. And, and I understand, listen, I understand that there have been plenty of people who have said they're dreaming a dream for God and really all they wanted was notoriety for themselves. 
We were joking the other day, uh, I think it was yesterday morning, men's breakfast. We had a nice, nice crowd of men in here. That was a really, really good. Uh, you, you're all, if you're a man, you're, invite, you're invited to the next one. I think we had 23, 23 people, something like that. But, uh, and the food's always good. Fellowship is better. So I was talking with a couple of the trustees about some of the projects we have going on here. And uh, we're, we're meeting to make storage rooms to put stuff. We're running out of room. That's a good problem to have. Uh, but we were joking about dreaming. And I said, well, we got a lot of property down there. You never know what God's going to have us do with it, you know. And Bill Schrader said, jokingly, the Bitesville Conference Center. Yes. And, and I said, it ain't going to have anybody's name on it. It's Jesus, right? So I know that we've all heard the stories about, you know, yeah, yeah, say it's for God, but it's really not. I'm talking about God-sized dreams. Can we all agree we're not talking about personal kingdoms? Okay, we're talking about dreaming dreams for God. What would bless God's heart more than people coming to know His Son? What would bless God more than, than having a church comprised of people, and we are doing really good at this, that aren't concerned about themselves, they're more concerned for other people. Yes. Those are the kind of dreams that we need to fuel. I think it's a good exercise when it comes to what we do here at the church to let God fill your mind with some extremes. You know, when I won't get political, I promise. When, when the people who were touting like the Green New Deal, it's, it sounded ridiculous, right? Regardless of where you stand on environment, I'm not trying to get into that. I'm just saying, I mean, we should take care of what God has created. But what I'm saying is the extremes to which that got pushed, that we said, well, that's just ridiculous. That's impossible. But by the time they argue with it, you come back and you've already moved this far. You see what I mean? So a lot of times from a political standpoint, the, the, the politics of it is make it sound so crazy that you can at least come back to five feet from where you started. And I think we need to turn that around for good. Just dream so crazy for the glory of God that he just has to be in it. Amen. Right? And we don't have to, we don't have to hold God accountable. He does what he wants. But what is the harm in dreaming? I dream a lot around here and I keep it inside. It's not time to release that dream yet. There are many times that I'm going to encourage you, dream. Don't talk about it. Let it, let it, let it work. Treat it like a seed. And when the time is right, you'll know it. And you maybe grab a close friend and say, Tammy, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> I got a dream. Can I share it with you? When the time is right. right. I want to talk about another man who was a dreamer. And he has a biblical name, Jeremiah. But you won't find him in the Bible. Jeremiah Lanfear, he was a lay minister in the Dutch Reformed Church in Manhattan in the 1850s. And the church had been seeing much decline. People were kind of disinterested. So they asked Jeremiah Lanfear to go around to the members of the congregation and trying to encourage them to get more plugged in. And they were kind of like, eh, sound familiar? You think that's a recent thing? <laughs> Not at all. In the 1850s, pre-Civil War, the decline of the American church was just staggering. Jeremiah Lamphere went around and tried to stir up interest, and he was so frustrated with what he saw. So he decided to be the one. And he rented a hall, and he advertised Wednesday noon prayer meetings. Every Wednesday, we're going to meet over the lunch hour. And he advertised it primarily to the businesses in downtown Manhattan. That happened on September 23rd, 1857. And the first 30 minutes of that prayer meeting, half of that first meeting, he prayed alone. Just Jeremiah and no one else. In the last 
half an hour, another man came in. And toward the end of the hour, four more. The next week, there were 20 people. The week after that, there were 40 people. And by October, the meetings became daily meetings. January 1858, the meetings expanded into a second room. February 1858, a third room. And then shortly after that, 20 more prayer meetings had popped up around the city. Pretty soon, by mid-March, they had to rent a 3,000-seat theater to handle the crowds that came. And by the end of March, every downtown New York church was filled, and every public hall filled to capacity. 10,000 men were gathering daily for prayer. And that happened in six months. But it took one person with a dream big enough that would not be defeated. How many people? Their dream is only big enough to get to that first day. And after 30 minutes, da, I'm going home. The revival that followed lasted into 1859. And it was one of the kickoff events that led to what is termed as the Third Great Awakening. It's the first Great Awakening to have its roots and beginnings in the United States of America, and it spread around the world. And it continued, the, the historians say, until about 1930. And what that means is the Pentecostal revivals of the early 20th century that launched our movement were part of a third great awakening that in part came into fruition because of someone named Jeremiah Lanfear who said, I'm going to be the one something needs to change. No one would know his name today if he hadn't a dream big and stepped up to be the one. Began in the heart of a lay preacher who dared to dream big. And look what happened. He was not going to listen to the naysayers. He was not going to have anyone say, oh, that's ridiculous. Stop. Stop daydreaming. Stop living out pipe dreams. He didn't listen to him. He had to have naysayers. He had to. Not being swayed by the critics, right? Not being dismissed by all the Pharisees. He was genuinely accepting God's goals to be accomplished through him. You know, most leaders aren't born. You ever hear the phrase born leader? I guess that happens, but I think most leaders are not born. They're developed. And a true leader is one that can be led. Three men we've had the example of today. It doesn't discount the women. Three men that we listed today that dared to lead. And over a period of time, we don't know all of the history of Jeremiah, but he didn't just wake up one day deciding to lead a citywide prayer revival. God worked on him and developed him into the kind of person that could lead no matter what. And he didn't lead by saying, you'd better show up. He led by example. So I want to challenge you today. Dream big dreams, but dream for others. Dream for the glory of God. If no one ever knows that you came up with the dream, you got to be okay with that. If you don't get any credit, you got to be okay with that. If somebody else gets the credit in your presence, you got to be okay with it. This is a dream that is born out of the work of the Holy Spirit that says something's got to change. Something's got to change. And I believe in a God who is big enough that if I just put my foot forward and say I'm willing to be used of God and I'm willing to stay the course, wow. Just imagine what we could see. I think, I think we're at the beginnings of the fourth great awakening. Yes. Yeah. 
And you know why I think that? Because all the Pharisees were saying it could never happen. Oh, it's all over. Don't you know? It's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And we're going to have to sit here and go, oh, God, what are we going to do now? Until he finally comes and rescues us. He's coming for a church triumphant, spotless, without spot or wrinkle. He's not coming for a bunch of defeated people. I know the world's going to keep getting worse. But the church, (laughs) the gates of hell will not prevail against the true church of God. So when we dream big dreams, dream them for the honor and glory of God. If God has to break some flesh and self off of you, just let him do it. Let him do it. You know, I, I stand up here, and, and I know a lot of you know where I'm coming from. I'm kind of like the guy responsible, right? And it's real easy for me to be the guy as nice as you were today, talking about all those nice things you said. It's very hard for me to I just kind of sit there like this. I am not the guy to cheer on. I'm not the guy to say yay to. It's Jesus. Amen. Whenever you have a, a position of leadership where you are leading people, the last person they should see is you. It's got to be Jesus. Amen. It has to be. And I don't always do that successfully. But he's working on me. We have a world without hope. Team, would you get ready to come back? We're going to have a time of worship as we close up today. But there are people without hope, and they disguise it really well. They act tough. And these are the ones that tonight, when they're watching Super Bowl, they're going to get so sloshed they don't even remember the game. They're the people that have to brag on all of their achievements and all that they've done. They're going to be the people that put on a good front, but when it gets quiet and when the reflection comes and when their conscience, which every person has created by God, begins to bother them, they will feel hopeless. We have the answer. We can't fix them, but we know who can. There are people that need hope. We need to be able to give them. They're trapped and they're confused. There are people that have been lied to. There are people that have been lied to about the heart of God. There are people that have been lied to and they had Pharisees going, you'd better do this. You'd better not do this. Instead of teaching them how to have their heart renewed so that their reborn spirit chooses to do things differently. How many have grown tired of trying to reform yourself It works a whole lot better when we let God do it from the inside out. You can keep all the rules you could come up with and be lost as Nebuchadnezzar. You can do all the right things and you can avoid doing all the wrong things without a change of heart. It's filthy rags because that is our righteousness, not God's. There are people trapped in that. How do we reach them? How do we reach the people that are done? with church because they've had too many. How do we reach the people that, that don't have anything to do with church because when they went there, people talked about sin and they went, ooh, ooh, I don't like that. I'm offended. How do we reach people that for too long we've allowed to just kind of, you know, well, there they are. What can we do about it? I love that. You, you can only do what you can. That's right. And very seldom do. How can we reach them? We don't water down the gospel. Not at all. But if we think that our whole totality of reaching people who need hope is contingent upon them coming in here, we're missing all kinds of opportunities. Dream big. How can we reach a hurting world? And we're not the only church in town. We're not the only ones. We're not the only ones that have the truth. How can we work with other people? That, that are committed to the truth of the gospel to reach people who are without hope. There are people that are facing the consequences of their sin. You know what? God forgives. 
and he looks at you justified, like you've never sinned. But the consequences of those sin remain. And sometimes we have to deal with it. And just because our consequences are not physical for the world to see, we have to also have a heart that says, yeah, but their consequence is just the same. So I want to extend you some grace as you recover and become the person God wants you to be. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who because of his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If you're trusting in your own righteousness, today would be a good day to stop. Today would be a good day to just say, I have nothing to bring to the table. And that's where he wants you. God, I just give you everything, warts and all. Trust me, he knows more than you do. And just say, I can't. I can't do it. I've tried. It doesn't work. Would you make me into the kind of person who can? That's the born-again experience. Without the born-again experience, there's no transformation. Without transformation, we're the same old people putting on Band-Aids. Without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we just become good people. That we're good when other people are watching. And when we're alone with God, it's like, oh, I feel awful about myself. He doesn't intend for us to live that way. He wants us to live free. He wants to live free from the chains and shackles that hold us back. We we can't see God as a taskmaster who has imposed these rules of living. And there are rules. But he's not one who imposed them like someone with a magnifying glass on an insect. I hope no one ever did that. I didn't. But it's not God's heart. He says, look, I've made a way. I've made a way. You don't have to go through this. Would you just come to me?